of day, teaching and learning the recursive reading and writing strategy with DJ Henry. DJ is a veteran teacher with over 25 years of community college classroom experience. During the course of her teaching career, DJ has served on several federally funded grants designed to infuse teaching and learning with sound pedagogies and technological supports. She has extensive experience in the standardized testing of literacy competencies and has worked with the state of Florida as an item writer, rubric writer, and reader for the college level academic skills test and the state developmental reading and writing exit exam. She also served as a reader for the Florida teacher certification exam for over 15 years. In addition to her many esteemed publications with Pearson, including her new integrated reading and writing textbook, The Effective Reader Writer, publishing this summer, she has published innovations in authentic assessments that utilize student portfolio pedagogies. A passionate educa educator and dedicated colleague, DJ continues to share her expertise in reading, writing, and authentic assessment through numerous presentations and workshops at national, regional, and local conferences and individual colleges. Her presentation today will illustrate ways to combine research-based, classroom-tested best practices of reading and writing into a recursive strategy for engaging with and creating texts. The reading writing strategy guides students to activate prior knowledge, ask and answer questions, infer and imply, develop vocabulary, make meaning, as well as evaluate, synthesize, and apply new information as readers and writers. DJ explains and illustrates the specific phases of the reading writing strategy with classroom ready learning activities and graphics. The discussion of the strategy includes topics such as reading, writing to learn, modeling, and assigning think alouds for readers and writers and types of written responses to reading selections. And DJ, I'm so happy to talk with you as always. Are you ready to begin? I am. Great. Hello everyone, it's wonderful to be with you today. I am uh, very excited about um, sharing what I've learned these past several years um, as a um, writer of developmental curriculum that, that integrates both reading and writing. Um, I'm going to talk about some big, big idea, uh, overview um, ideas, and then I'm also going to give some real practical hands-on approaches as well. I'm, quite confident that some of the things I'll say you already know. <laughs> I might just be stirring up your prior knowledge and affirming that you are already doing all that you need to be doing. Um, to begin with, I wanted to talk, I wanted to remind all of us that um, reading and writing is a communication cycle and that uh, we really do only one at a time. We ask students to shift roles in this new approach of integrating reading and writing so that in one classroom, they will be um, having to determine whether uh, what strategies to apply as a reader and then what strategies to apply as a writer. And uh, establishing and learning how to establish and, and uh, manage a dialogue on paper. Um, for example, in the uh, cognitive ability uh, or skill of implying and inferring ideas, I even like to use this graphic with students to show them that it is a communication process and that they do need to think about um, who their uh, audience is when they're writing, but also who the writer is and the writer's point when they're reading. Because uh, the writer, based on word choice, um, chooses to imply something and then the reader must work to infer the writer's meaning. Um, so it, it really is a, a considerate and thoughtful dialogue. And I wanted to share an example with you. Um, if you look at this uh, particular sentence, the driver of the rear-ended vehicle was irate about the damage to his car. And the, the key word here, the uh, focus word is irate. And if you look at this screen, you can see by having a more holistic, um, integrated reading and writing approach, there are several different skills that we can teach our students by making uh, them think about this as a process, guiding them to think about this as a process. We're looking at dictionary skills, you know, what does it, what's the literal meaning of the word? We're looking at denotations and connotations. We're looking at tone, and we're looking at implying and inferring. So we're, we're really able to um, teach uh, 
a richly textured lesson um, that brings several different skills together. And a screen like this, a shot like this in, in the um, teaching process is really helpful for students to see the work that the writer does and then the work that the reader does to maintain this conversation. Now, implying and inferring ideas are just one of several cognitive behaviors that readers and writers share. Um, here are a few of the others. These are the most common ones listed by research. Sometimes they word them a little bit differently, um, may have one or two uh, variations. But both readers and writers to communicate and to have this dialogue have to do these things. They question, they predict. Prediction is a form of inferring. Uh, they have to clarify, make connections. Rereading and revising are uh, mirror um, cognitive behaviors. Visualizing and summarizing. Both readers and writers must do this to make meaning, to construct meaning. And they do these things in phases. Sometimes they do all of these in each phase. Sometimes one phase of the process might focus on uh, more heavily on one of these behaviors. For example, pre-reading relies heavily on questioning and predicting, while during reading we're really looking for clarification um, and perhaps rereading to compare uh, to repair um, comprehension. And the same goes for writing. Um, when these occur throughout the process is part of what we're trying to model and uh, teach our students to do. So as we go through the rest of this, this presentation, these are the main cognitive behaviors that I'm going to be constantly building each activity on, upon. <clears throat> now, one of the other things I, I really wanted to point out to you is that we're not really doing anything new. We have been teaching reading and writing for our entire careers. Uh, we, at the developmental level, we haven't done it in many uh, uh, um, parts of the country in the same classroom. We have divided them in, in, and compartmentalized them into reading classrooms and writing classrooms. But our writing classrooms used readings, and our reading classrooms used writing to learn. So we are building on what we already know to do. And we're also having a wonderful conversation with each, each other as professionals, reading teachers and writing teachers coming together to find out what we do share and how we can um, uh, communicate that shared knowledge to our students. So some of the sound pedagogies that we're going to be looking at, these are all research-based. These have been in, in place for, for a long time and have great success behind them. Um, um, these become the, um, the foundations of classroom experiences. So we're looking at reading to learn, uh, writing to learn, and then the reader response that brings writing and reading together. You know, uh, when we respond to a piece of text, then we are engaging both, of course, our reading and our writing uh, expertise. And the thing that's so, so encouraging to see is that reading to learn and writing to learn are really focusing, using the same tools. We're reading to learn ideas, well, and we're uh, language and structure and to make connections. And that's the same thing that we're doing when we write. Um, the purpose of writing is to deepen our understanding and to share knowledge. And in terms of the writing, you can see that I have put self-assessment here, which is the metacognitive, the monitoring comprehension. And so that then also is a part of what Reading to Learn is doing. We ask students to think about how they make meaning and where their barriers may occur and what kind of fix-up strategies they can use. They can use their writing to do that. They can have uh, journal entries and other things that we'll talk about in a few minutes. So these are the three areas, uh, the three types of writing, reading and writing that we're going to be doing in the integrated classroom. So here's the reading journals. Um, you, know, you can call them journals. You can call them portfolios. It's really helpful for students to house their work in a, and organize their work so that they can see growth and development over the semester. Um, you'll see several of the different um, activities that I designed for students to do that, that they can track their progress. There's nothing more encouraging to a student than for them to actually 
see the progress that they're making, particularly because they can become so easily discouraged. So tracking that success and letting them see how they're growing and maturing is a real um, undergirding um, and positive scaffold for them to build. So in their reading journals um, some, and writing journals, some of the things that they're going to be doing is they're, they're going to be thinking about their thinking. They're constantly going to be asking not only about the text that they're reading, say they're reading about recycling, they're going to ask these questions about that, but they're also going to be asking these questions about, about their behaviors as readers and their behaviors as writers. And they're going to find their strengths, and they're going to find their needs, and they're going to take responsibility for addressing them by asking these questions. And one of the ways to do that is through the Think Aloud. And the Think Aloud has been a very popular, uh, very effective, and, and, um, uh, and standard, really, in reading classrooms. And it's not been as heavily used, as far as I know, in my experience with talking to teachers in the writing classroom. But it's very, very useful and helpful there as well. One example of the Think Aloud that's a written one is um, that we use in the writing classroom is um, like the Dear Editor letter. Dear Editor, my essay is about, I um, struggled with, could you give me advice about, you know, uh, many of us have asked our students to do that. Um, and then we've asked students to do peer reviews. So those are Think Alouds where they actually write down what they're thinking about the writing process. So the, the a think aloud is a quick dis, you know, definition here, the mental process that one goes through to make meaning. What kind of decisions do we make? And it is like eavesdropping on someone's thinking. And it does monitor comprehension, repairs confusion, and it fosters effective communication as a writer. Now this screen is a very interesting screen. This is an actual screenshot, and you can see in my source here, um, that I have identified uh, Jeffrey Willem as you know the, the, the source, the author of this, because he has a, a, a really effective book. It was first published, I think, in 2001, and then the last couple of years he's done an update to it. And it's about using think alouds to help readers um, uh, monitor their comprehension. So because we don't read and write at exactly the same time, and it's a process that we go through, and we begin oftentimes with reading process, I wanted to begin with, you know, Think Aloud's fostering reading comprehension. So this is what he does. And I took this again, if you look at the source information, if you go to that website, you, this is um, just one little part of a very in-depth and well thought out um, manual, if you will, about how to do um, Think allows in the reading with a piece of reading text, and he has a flow chart. It's really, really helpful. But I just wanted you to see that his main headings here about how how to teach it. The teacher does it, and then the students watch, and then the teacher does it again with another piece of text, and the students verbally chime in and help. And then the next piece of text, the student does it, and the teacher helps. So, and then eventually you hand off independently to them and they do it in small groups with each other or independently in their uh, reading writing journals. So I really liked these, these four, uh, three headings here that really kind of show you, you know, how to implement it. And again, this is a wonderful resource to go to um, for many more ideas about how to do it. Now, this, these are some think aloud prompts that you can use for reading comprehension. Um, and again, if you notice, I, um, although I, I took many of the prompts and modified them from the scholastic source, I actually put them into the, underneath the headings that tie up with the cognitive behaviors that readers and writers share. So uh, predictions, you know, I'm, uh, I, I think this will happen next, I wonder if this, I, I think this piece is going to be about the author probably believes, the tone of this will be, and you can see based on what kind of predictive question you're asking them, that's going to be the focus of your lesson. I mean, you wouldn't ask all, you wouldn't have a necessarily predict every single thing that they could possibly predict, but whatever skill or concept that you are, is the focus of that day's class, that's where your predictions would probably come to. And then the personal connections um, and text connections, 
and then helping them visualize how do these words, what kind of a picture do, do these words create in, in the mind's eye. Um, the clarification is probably the best place and the weakest place, the clarifying and the uh, repairing confusion. These two are really where students greatly benefit from some modeling and from some practice. Um, because this is where they, they tend to give up. You know, they, they're very used to plowing through text and getting frustrated and then just starting all the way back at the beginning again and reading up until they get frustrated. Well, this gives them these kinds of prompts and discussions about what they can do as they read um, to repair confusion is extremely helpful for them. They can grow years worth in one semester by doing this kind of thinking. Um, now there's also think alouds for writing and they are actually called write alouds and again I've given you the um, source and the reason that I just went and got screen, I, I did, I went and grabbed screenshots and, and gave you these um, links is because I want you to see how much um, uh, or how many resources are available, the depth of resources that are available to you on the internet. With a little Googling and a little searching and a few keywords, you can come up with so many reinforcements and so many ideas. But this just talks about how to um, set up a think aloud about writing or write aloud. And um, again, as the introduction says, 10 to 15 minute lessons. Just give you a second to kind of look over this. This is a wonderful thing to do with them first. As, and this particular source encourages us as teachers to do our own writing, you know, to write the example text that we're going to bring in front of them and then um, talk about it, you know, uh, the decisions that we made as we wrote the text. You know, where, where did we have difficulty? Why did we have to revise? You know, so just really showing them how to go through the writing process. And then here are some prompts, some write aloud prompts. And if you notice, again, it's, they're tied to the um, shared behaviors that both readers and writers must perform to make meaning. And again, you can see that um, you wouldn't overload students with all of these at one time, that you would ask these questions as directed um, thinking activities to reinforce the point or the lesson that you have planned for that particular day. These are also um, wonderful um, prompts to ask students to use in the peer review of each other's essays or paragraphs. Um, this is, um, again, a, just another way of looking at uh, predictions and evidence, and this um, can be used throughout the process, uh, before, during, and after. Uh, and it, I just put it in this format so that you can see how they correlate. You know, what's the writer's main point? You know, and then what is the main point I want to make? What's the writer's purpose? What is my purpose? See, we're, we need to ask the same questions. We just change our, our viewpoint, our vantage point. So that's just like, you know, to introduce the idea. But here are two separate handouts that I just kind of um, copied into this one slide. Um, these are... Um, one's for the writer and one's for the reader. So before reading, you know, what do I think if I did a quick skim of the information, you know, looking for keywords, what do I think the main point's going to be, the topic's going to be? Why is this information important? And then after reading, they come back to these same questions and they answer them again, and then they compare their before reading and their after reading and this, this offers a wonderful opportunity to talk about having to make adjustments in perception. You, know, you predict something and then you have to confirm it, but then maybe you may, as a reader, you even have to kind of adjust that prediction you know, and, and change thinking a little bit. Well, writers go through that same process that as they plan and draft an essay or a paragraph. They may find that their original plan had to be adjusted as they gathered information and as they selected words and organized. And so asking students to do this before and after it heightens their awareness of the decisions that they can make and how much control they really do have in, in the process. 
So these are the types of connections that we're going to ask uh, readers to do as they respond. You know, they're going to respond to a piece of writing. And um, the, the first and, and uh, most popular and most obvious, of course, is the summary. And you know, learning through summary is such a great um, and powerful tool. And not only learning about the, the particular topic, reading topic that we're asking them to look at, um, again, like recycling or um, uh, history, a lesson in history, whatever it is we're asking them to write, uh, to read about and understand, if they summarize it, as, you know, restating it allows them to see whether or not they under, um, monitor their comprehension, allows them to monitor their comprehension. And it ties back to the author. It's all about what the author wants to say. And this is usually formal and third person. And with all the reforms that are sweeping the nation right now, the formal third person voice is the one that is most rewarded right now. But then the personal response that connects the text to the individual. It's usually informal and first person. And in a couple of slides, I'll show you some of the different connections that, that, that we can make on the personal level. And then, of course, the critical response would be connecting the text to the world or to other texts. And again, it's usually formal and third person. So, the way in which I use the personal responses um, if, uh, most effectively, I think, is in the writing to learn and stirring up metacognition. You know, um, uh, what do I know? All you know about this topic. You know, to call up the prior knowledge. So at the beginning, before reading or before writing, what do I already know about this? And then moving students to move out of that personal response into the critical response. You know, well. Uh, well, how can I connect this to the world or to another piece of text or to a particular audience? So I wanted to share with you an assignment, a really specific assignment. And the way it shows up on the slides is in a series of slides. But this is actually, these next few slides are taken from a two-page handout, a front and back handout. So teaching students how to write a summary early in the semester, and then getting them to summarize everything <laughs> throughout the semester. I even get them to summarize the, the reading concept or the writing concept that we're looking at, you know, as well as the topic that we're reading and writing about. So here are three steps. It's, it's going to be either um, state the topic sentence, or it's going to be create one if the topic sentence is implied. So it's going to be a three step process. Students like that a lot. It's very simple, straightforward. So that's the, you know, the directions. And then here's an example. We'll give them this, this paragraph. And then I do a model for them. And I would put this on the overhead. Actually, probably what I would do, um, instead of giving them the completed one, I would annotate and mark the text in front of them and discuss all of these things as I was doing it. Of course, that means that this is prepared ahead of time so that you don't have to, you know, try and do it on the, on the fly. But this is an example of a written think aloud. Why did I cross this out? You know, which step did this go to? Well, it was, you know, I'm, I want to condense this, um, our looking condenses uh, what our minimum requires, must require, demand, may be most important. Those are all the verbs that uh, job employers are looking for. So just condense that to our looking. See, I'm going to explain to the students how I came about doing this, the decisions I made. And then I, you know, we end up with the final product. So I would do this with them, with a sample text like this. Then I would do another sample text where they helped me, where the students did it, and then I assisted them. And then I would do a third one where they get into their small groups and they do it with each other. And that brings us to the think, pair, share. Um, and this is, you know, how do you make these connections to the text, to the self, and to the world? So I just showed you about the summary. We could do, when I, after I modeled it for them and had them practice it and then release them with a third text to their small groups, then they're, they're going to do the, the think, pair, and the share. So they're going to go through these steps there. And this is just a few, again, if you think about the uh, think aloud and the write aloud prompts, that's what these are. These are now just 
worded in such a way to help students make connections. Now what we've been talking about up until now are individual assignments. You know, so what I wanted to show you was kind of um, the whole process, the bigger picture. So this is the reading writing strategy that brings the best of what we know about um, both processes, reading and writing, into one um, process, uh, one, one um, uh, strategy that students can uh, practice and apply. So you can see it has a lot of the SQ3R in it, you know, survey, question, read, respond. So, and, and these tasks are listed for them under each step so that students can know what it is that they need to do in that particular, in that particular step. And again, if you think about the think alouds um, that we were just looking at and, and how, where we would put those into each one of these, see, we would, could do a think aloud about pre-reading and then, you know, how to annotate and then even how to review, you know, how do you do peer edits? You know, that's a great thing to think aloud with students. Students were always so reluctant to, to peer edit because they feel like they knew enough information to edit somebody else's paper or they felt insecure about their own opinion. So doing a model of that, doing a think aloud with them and showing them how to do it and, and then giving them some practice before they do it in their, in their pairs is a very, very helpful for them. So after I introduced the whole strategy to them, I also asked them to engage in this strategy by this is the same strategy, the colors just changed, but this is a self-assessment. So at the beginning of the semester, in that first week when we're trying to get to know each other and settle down our enrollment, um, I ask students, before they even see this, before they see the strategy, I ask them to think aloud, on paper even, to write it out. Um, what do you do to read? What steps do you take to read? What steps do you take to write? And then after they've gotten that written and they've reported that and I hand, I hand them this and we go over this strategy, um, I ask them to check the box, you know, check the little checklist, you know, how many of these do you really do? And I have found that students are um, sometimes a little generous you know, with their check marks, you know, I do all this. <laughs> so then when they turn in an assignment and it looks like they could use some help and they need to revise, we pull this back out and ask them again, ask each, that particular student, well, did you do this step? Which of these could you apply in the revision of your paper? And which of these could you apply the next time you do an assignment? And that's why I even put the time on task. Not that I'm trying to get them to spend a lot of time on task. I just, although the more you do, the better you become, but I want them to see what they're actually doing. Because you can't correct what you don't know you're doing. If you don't know you have a problem, you don't know to correct it. So this becomes an, uh, uh, something that I used throughout the semester uh, at least three times during the semester, the beginning, the middle, at the end. I use it more frequently for students who are a little bit weaker and need to have more intervention. It can become then the basis of conferences. But this is a think aloud. That's what this is, or a write aloud, if you will. And I also created one for research. And you can see that the major steps are the same. Research fits in very nicely to this. But all the individual steps within or below each of those heads are geared towards research. So it kind of gives the students an idea of when they need to be accomplishing certain parts of the task. Again, this can be put into a um, student self-assessment so that um, they can check off the ones that, that they do and how much time they spend on tasks. The one thing I do tell students that this is recursive and that's why the arrows point back and forth is that many effective readers and writers repeat steps. Sometimes they have to go all the way back to the beginning and you know, a preview and question again. Sometimes they just need to stop and um, reread a little bit in that one section. Um, 
with the revision part, sometimes when they get into the revising of a, a good writer, when they start really looking at, at, at their first draft and want to revise it, they see that maybe they need to do a little bit more brainstorming. So every step, you know, you, it, you don't have to go linearly. It can be recursive. But not only that, this looks like we all think exactly alike, and we really don't. For example, I could never outline first. I had to do a free write first, and then out of that free write, I could do my outline. So I encourage students to really think about how they could adapt this to their own mental processes so it works best for them. They don't have to do it like I'm telling them, but they have to be able to explain why they're doing it the way they're doing it and show good results from it. Now, the last few slides are just kind of a list of different types of activities. I have been growing a bank of classroom ready, camera ready. You can photograph them and take them into class and use them right away. So I just kind of wanted to go over this list. Um, uh, some of, if, if you've attended to any of my workshops before, some of these I've already uh, put into circulation. Some of them are new. Uh, but the Dear Editor cover letter uh, asks students to do that with every single piece of writing that they turn in for a formal grade, which tells me, you know, I have a series of questions that they have to answer and they, and, uh, they have to tell me their purpose and you know, uh, um, what they like about their essay, about their reading, um, uh, what they need help with. You know, so it really asks them to think aloud, to write aloud about their reading and writing process. I do have a rubric and I have a study plan and that study plan shows students how to uh, self guide students into organizing their work and um, self-assessing. And you just saw the reading writing strategy self-assessment. Uh, reciprocal, these are teaching approaches, the reciprocal teaching steps and a, a learning log and that's a, a form of group work where there are four students in a group and everybody has a role. Um, one reads, one questions, one clarifies, one predicts, and um, uh, then when they're through with that, they fill out their learning log about the, um, the, the kinds of things that they've learned from their reading. This is a wonderful, wonderful way for, the, for them to group read a piece of text in preparation for a writer's response. You saw the strategy for writing a summary and the think and pair and the think aloud prompts. And then, of course, these are pretty, um, you know, the Cornell two-note columns. I just went ahead and created one for students that I could just hand out to them. And word maps. The KWL is uh, before, during, and after. And it, you, uh, students can use this with both reading and writing. What do I need to know? What do I already know? What do I need to learn? And then what did I learn afterwards? Um, that can be about their reading process, their writing process, or the content that they're studying. And the review and revise feedback log is a way to uh, track grammar. Several times throughout the semester, this grammar and context, I do a line item edit where I point out everything. I don't do that to them every single time because it's time consuming and because it's discouraging for them. Um, some of them. So several times throughout the semester I'll do a line item edit and then I ask them to uh, record their errors and the number of times they committed each one. Like if I pointed out run-ons or comma splices, usually they've done that more than once. <laughs> and it's a chronic problem. So maybe they'll write down 10, the number 10 for run-ons and then they can see that if they just master that one skill they clear up a slew of problems in their writing. Uh, uh, this feedback log also works really well in terms of um, a slight adaptation of it is in terms of looking for certain types of sentences in the text that they're reading or stylistic devices and tracking how often a, a writer used a simple sentence or used transitions. So just having this review feedback log is a great way to do a text analysis. 
And then, of course, I like to end every single presentation with the emphasis on you. You are the most important element in that, the success of that classroom. Your enthusiasm and compassion and engagement and your modeling of all these behaviors that you're wanting them to experience. So I am ready for questions. DJ, I was thinking about um, you know the the way that um, you know the way we talk about the connections between um, reading and writing are uh, pedagogical and they're shaped by um, you know how we have uh, learned um, and interacted uh, with the disciplines. Um, do you do you think that students come to integrated reading and writing feeling like they are two separate subjects? Or do you think that students are in some ways more open to seeing those connections um, than, than we would have maybe anticipated or that we within the disciplines um, have been? Well, I think that's a, a difficult question to answer because um, there's such a variation in teaching approaches, mm -hmm. particularly to in the high school level where many of our students are coming, from which they're coming. Um, I mean, one of the reasons we need this reform is because students aren't reading in our students, our developmental students, like not all, not all students, but our develop, many of our developmental students are not reading and writing in their academic classrooms. Um, lots of times um, they've been given skill and drill work that's not connected to a process. Uh, lots of times they haven't been expected to enter college, so it's not been a possibility for them. So this higher level critical thinking is something that it's just not been expected of them. Mm -hmm. So I think many times our students come to us with um, a very limited view of what reading and writing really is mm -hmm. as yeah. an individual. And, and I think that they would probably see a greater um, need for reading perhaps than writing, but even then I'm not exactly sure that that's true. Yeah. Well, you've, we've seen a lot of changes and I know um, I know you and I have seen a lot of the changes together, just um, traveling and um, doing workshops or meeting up at um, conferences. I mean, the, the move to integrate reading and writing is for some people very new, but um, but for others, you know, it's, it's something that's been um, circulating for a long time. So in, in some ways, it's just a really exciting time. What, what, do, you, what do you think is, um, you know, where do you get inspired by all these changes? What do you think are some of the most exciting um, changes or outcomes that you've seen? Well, I... Um I think change it. For, let me start by saying I think change is really hard. Yeah. <laughs> it's so hard and, and uh, particularly when we spent so much time building really effective curriculums. And, you know, uh, despite all the bad press the developmental programs have gotten, we have helped countless students. Mm -hmm. There's many, many successes out there. So I, I think it's really hard to shift once you've already researched and, and you've gotten a really workable curriculum in place. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think one of the things that's, one of the greatest challenges I think of this reform is that putting reading and writing into one class, one semester, really ups the difficulty level, particularly for developmental students because they, they really seem to need their information to be kind of chunked, which is why sometimes I think the the drill and skill has been so successful is because they can really um, focus in on chunks of information. Yeah. The exciting thing about this is that this then shows students how to take those chunks and put them into a process. Mm. And I think the transferring knowledge is one of the most difficult things for us to instill in our students. I mean, I can't tell you how many times as an 1101 teacher, composition teacher, I 
give a student a great grade. They did great in my class. And then a history teacher come to me later and say, why didn't you teach them how to research and document? And I'm like, I did. They did a great job for me. They're just not transferring that skill to this new situation. Mm -hmm. And that may be what is really ex one of the most exciting things that I see is that we get to really show them how to plug these individual skills into the bigger picture, into the process, and how they can really master the process. They can create their own reading writing strategy that's going to work for them in any situation. The classroom, the job, everyday life, it, it's not yeah. limited you know, just to the academic classroom. So that's, that's one of the things I think is really exciting about it. You know, I think that's a great point because um, everyone's concerned about skills transfer, and that's um, you know that's something that that we have to think about at every level, from developmental and also you know composition. All the gateway courses are very much about that, and so you know, in thinking about about a productive process, you know, the hope the hope is that you know we're helping students kind of knit things together. They're they're knitting together gather prior knowledge and essential processes in, in the hopes that they're kind of, I don't know, creating for themselves a really um, strong fabric, you know, of, right. of knowledge. Right. And also yeah. in terms of connecting to, uh, when you connect the reading and writing so that students are going to be doing reader responses, they're going to write in response to what they have read. Mm -hmm. Then it's a little bit easier to build a depth of information about a particular topic because you really do want them to read more than one, one piece on a particular topic. I mm -hmm. came across a really wonderful lesson um, about Langston Hughes when I was doing research for this presentation where this one teacher um, did the think aloud and uh, with one of uh, his poems, her one of her favorite poems of his. And she modeled how to decode the poem and everything. And then she took another poem, a second poem, and she um, assisted the whole class to do that second poem. And then she broke them into groups, and each group had their own individual poem. And uh, they all talked about it. And then the next class, they came in, and they, um, she reassigned them so that everybody was in a different group, and everybody had to share what they learned the day before from their first group. It was just a wonderful, it was two days, two days of classwork, and those students got a half a dozen or more poems. And uh, a lot of good information or ideas about what they wanted to research to learn more about him as an author. So it was just a really fun way to see how they still had to go through the reading writing process. They still had to pre-read. They had to question. They had to annotate. They had to brainstorm. In fact, the whole process of the think and the, and the pair and the share is that that's the pre-write. And then students go from that with a better idea of how, of how they want to respond in writing. Mm -hmm. Well, that's neat. Huh. Well, we don't have any more questions, so we're going to go ahead and wrap up, and I'll let you get uh, get on with your day. I hope the weather is uh, sunnier in Florida than it is up here in North Carolina. <laughs> <laughs> it's been wonderful here. It always is, DJ. <laughs> probably <laughs> probably because you're there, I think. Oh, you're <laughs> Well, it was great to talk with you again. Thank you. Thank you, DJ. And thank you, everyone, for um, for joining us today. Um, if you need a certificate of participation, you can email me. My address is here on the screen. If you're interested in our other professional development and partnership programs, please bookmark our catalog page. It's pearsonhighered.com backslash English, and you can stay up to date um, through that page on uh, all of our partnership uh, programs and professional development opportunities. Um, and you can visit Pedagogy and Practice. The URL for that has been uh, broadcasting across several slides. You can also get to it from pearsonhighered.com backslash English. Pedagogy and Practice is an open access digital gallery for professional development and the recorded sessions, the presenter PowerPoints and other support materials um, from this conference will be posted there within the next two weeks. So um, I hope you'll check in there and I hope we'll see you again uh, on our fall conference. Bookmark pearsonhighered.com backslash English and you'll know uh, the exact date of that when we announce it, probably within the next couple weeks. Thanks again, everyone.
Bye now.